the heart of where innovation, money, and power collide. In Silicon Valley and beyond, this is Bloomberg Technology with Emily Chang. in San Francisco and this is Bloomberg Technology coming up in the next hour. Robinhood files to go public and lots of revelations in its S1 from massive losses in the first quarter to that FINRA fine and crypto trading. We'll cover it from all angles. Plus the metaverse. We dive into virtual worlds where AR, VR, online games and social networking converge. What are the growth opportunities? Turns out there's a lot of them. And Jeff Bezos welcomes an 82-year-old aviation pioneer to the flight crew ahead of Blue Origin's new Shepard launch, now just weeks away. We will have all the details. She was supposed to go to space 60 years ago, but never did. We'll introduce you to Wally Funk. All those stories in a moment, but first, U.S. stocks advancing on a fresh batch of economic data. Bloomberg's Kriti Gupta has the latest. Kriti, take it away. Well, Emily, the story today was really low volume. A lot of people gearing up for that July 4th long weekend. And that really results in kind of this float higher, this drifting higher. And that's really what you're seeing in the S&P 500, up half a percent on the day. But no thanks to tech. You really saw tech underperformance, which is why in relative to recent gains, a half a percent gain for the S&P 500 isn't really that much in perspective. So you do see the Nasdaq 100 about flat on the day, even big tech stocks flat on the day. Nothing super exciting there. And even yields, which tends to move tech a good chunk, only down one basis point. So let's just look at something that I think is pretty interesting, those chip maker stocks, because that's a crucial piece of that tech trade right now. And if you look at a longer term chart, you do actually see a massive move. But I want to point into or zero in to that year to date move because it kind of looks like a sideways trade, but they're kind of inching higher. And some of that it has to do with very specific players. So let's just look at some of those intraday movers today, because that is really where you did see a lot of that action. A lot of it was in the red with NVIDIA, of course, being that one major player that actually was the one upside gainer within the SOX index, that heavyweight. But let's just look at what else was driving. Micron in particular was the big heavy hitter, heavy volume for that stock, falling with concern that demand it might be peaking. This, of course, even with some positive third quarter fiscal results. And you had uh, MKSI agreed to, agreeing to, or MKS Instruments, excuse me, MKSI is the ticker, agreeing to a deal to buy specialty chemicals group Adotech for $5.1 billion in both cash and stock. So that M&A still very much kind of trickling in right now. And lastly, I do have to point out that Applied Materials, which has been moving quite a bit lately, down in sympathy and, of course, taking down the index altogether, Emily. All right, Kriti Gupta, thanks for breaking down those moves. Appreciate it. Turning now to Robinhood, filing for its IPO to list on the NASDAQ to break down what we learned from the S1. Bloomberg's Wall Street reporter, Shanali Basik. So, Shanali, a lot of revelations here. We were waiting for this for weeks. What were the most surprising takeaways for uh, you? Just how much money it has been making from crypto lately was definitely one revelation with a lot of that money, uh, almost a third, right? Very, a lot of money being made from Dogecoin in the most recent quarter. Those are just some fun facts. But also, you know, they swung to a profit last year, Emily. In the first quarter of this year, they posted losses. Uh, they had a slew of lawsuits and regulatory affairs that they have to contend with. That includes 15 punitive class action lawsuits over the 2020 outages, which we saw the FINRA fine for yesterday, their payment for order flow practices, which has another six punitive class actions, trading restrictions earlier this year, another 50 punitive class action lawsuits. And they also said the U.S. had demanded access to the CEO's phone records uh, in fresh disclosures as uh, prosecutors take a look at uh, their, their new inquiries from, from watchdogs on different behaviors. Now, uh, talk to us a little bit about the risk factors, because they talk about whether, uh, you know, if, for example, the SEC decided to crack down on payment for order flow, which is a huge part of Robinhood's business model, that that would be a risk. What do they say? Yeah, that's certainly a huge risk. We know that at times they have created 
like half of their revenue from payment for order flow. Uh, and But they have begun to diversify. The question is how quickly they can start to diversify away from that being such a core piece of their revenue. Other risk factors that were really interesting, given that 20 to 35 percent uh, of their IPO can be going to retail investors, uh, they also guided that there could be a lot of volatility in their stock. So there were really some, uh, and also they also uh, cited tough headlines from the media as another risk factor. So there were pages and pages of risk factors here. We knew that Robinhood would be a risky stock for investors. Another thing to be thinking about also is does their growth start to plateau? While we saw those daily active users, the, the monthly active users really surge in the first quarter, you saw the greatest number of that happening around February in the middle of the quarter. We don't have numbers, right, after March, after the first quarter. So should that start to moderate, there are questions about growth. At an estimated $40 billion for this listing, that is already more than 40 times last year's revenue. So it will be going public pretty richly. Right. And of course, as you mentioned, they were profitable last year, but they had a difficult quarter, first quarter of this year tied to that GameStop mania. You wonder if that's a one time thing or if that's something that's going to continue. Bloomberg Shanali Basik, thank you so much for breaking that down. I want to dive in further now to the regulatory angle on Robinhood. With us is David Chase, the former SEC Enforcement Division Senior Counsel and CEO of the law firm, David R. Chase. David, good to have you back on the show, um, look, we were waiting for this S1 for weeks. Uh, it wasn't happening. Our sources told us that the SEC was asking questions, which is not unusual. Um, but what can you tell us about what you imagined was going on behind the scenes as this company tried to get this document out the door? Well, there's a host of disclosures, obviously, when a company goes public. Um, you know, there's going to be a, a huge um, magnitude of disclosures that take place. And so uh, no doubt in the filing uh, that uh, Robinhood made for uh, its uh, bid to go public, um, there's a host of material critical information that has to be disclosed, both good and bad, uh, including its operations, its profitability, um, uh, regulatory uh, actions or investigations, including class actions, and the potential impact uh, upon the price of the stock. So it's, uh, it was a huge undertaking, but um, it's very much a sign of things and an indication of things to come once Robinhood becomes a publicly traded filing company. Now, a lot's happened since you and I last talked, which was sort of at the height of the GameStop craze. We've seen Vlad Tenev, the CEO, testify before Congress. We've seen them pay this fine to FINRA, but also doubling down on customer support, doubling down, they say, on investing in the stability of the platform. From what you've seen, is Robinhood a legitimate platform for trading, or do you have concerns? Well, um, you know, from all indications, it's a legitimate a viable platform um, that appears, in my opinion, to have gone uh, to under to have undergone growing pains, which is not um, atypical of uh, new emerging companies um, in the financial industry space, or for that matter, I think in any business space. And so, with it comes growing pains, and with it comes um, less than perfect policies and procedures. Uh, and operational issues. And my strong sense is, is that Robinhood, like a lot of other companies that grew extremely quickly, um, there's an element of catch up, both on the regulatory side and the business operation side, uh, as well as the disclosure side. And I think that's been, that was evidenced uh, in the announcement, I believe yesterday, where Robinhood paid the largest of record fine to FINRA of $70 million for a variety of infractions, although they neither admitted nor denied the allegations in the settlement. So I think that's a it's a very good indication that um, it's real. There's a clearly a following, but they need to you know pay attention uh, and have a vigilance for compliance, particularly if they're going to be a publicly traded filing company. Well, and you know, interesting fact. Obviously, you used to work at the SEC, Dan Gallagher, a top. Robin Hood executive was a former SEC commissioner. We learned from the S1 he's he's fairly well paid. So Robin Hood does have this regulatory expertise on the inside. You know, from your perspective, 
ha has that really helped? Um, do you see that vigilance that they need? Yeah, um, actually, I know Dan. He's a great guy, and uh, he's, he's a very good lawyer. And um, I think uh, it's a benefit to uh, to Robin Hood to have somebody with that experience and uh, track record, uh, an institutional kind of knowledge of the SEC, et cetera, uh, involved. Um, and, um, uh, you know, I, I, I do think with time, they will bring more resources on. They will learn from past, perhaps, indiscretions. Um, and will improve uh, their uh, their business operations and achieve, I would assume, a higher level of compliance. Um, now, though, going public, um, that will all be laid bare in a much more transparent basis. Um, they need to, you know, Robinhood, like any other publicly traded filing company, has to file financial statements, audited financials on an annual basis, needs to disclose material events, including litigation and regulatory actions, if it's deemed to be material to the business operations of the company, um, and to, you know, as you, you indicated, need to disclose other critical information to shareholders and the investing public, including executive compensation and, and share structure, et cetera. All right. Well, we're going to be covering every step of the way on their road to IPO. David R. Chase, former senior counsel at the SEC's Enforcement Division. Always appreciate your insights here, David, on the show. All right. Coming up, we're going to take a deep dive into the metaverse and the world of augmented and virtual reality with Matthew Ball, a managing partner at Epillion Company, who just launched an ETF that will allow you to invest in the technology driving this new meta world. This is Bloomberg. A 26-year-old software engineer at Microsoft was working on the company's e-commerce platform when he came across a major bug that enabled him to steal more than $10 million. He would later be found living off the proceeds in a seven-figure lakefront home with plans to buy a ski house, a yacht, a seaplane, but he got caught first. With more now on what's likely the biggest Xbox cheat in history, our own Max Chafkin with Bloomberg's Big Take Story of the Day. So Max, what exactly happened here? So what happened here is, as, as prosecutors called it, uh, it was a very old school crime with kind of a high tech MO. So basically this, this uh, Xbox uh, store engineer, so this is somebody who's working on Microsoft's online store, figured out that he could basically get an unlimited number of gift cards Print it up, and then he figured out a very clever way to uh, to turn those gift cards into cash. You know, normally, uh, like like many companies, Microsoft uh, operates its own sort of virtual currency. It prints, it creates these codes, which can be used to either buy, you know, games, like Xbox games, content, virtual goods, but also you know, physical goods, Dell laptops, Sonos speakers and basically figured out that there was a loophole in the way Microsoft was handling its sort of internal testing that allowed him to just create an unlimited uh, number of these. It's as if he found his own you know, Microsoft uh, currency printing press. Right, there's an interesting quote in your story uh, where uh, a colleague says that basically Microsoft left the doors to its own vault completely unlocked that said why did it take microsoft so long to figure it out and how, how you know at what point and how did they eventually catch him right so the 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 crazy thing about this is is yeah like you said that it that it, it the fraud was so big before it was found out the other thing that's kind of interesting is they assume this was some kind of sophisticated you know outside hacker uh, turned out inside you know employee who was basically just guessing his colleagues passwords a lot of these Test accounts had passwords like, you know, secret one, two, three, four. I mean, things you really, you know, you, you really hope that like a big company like Microsoft, that, that kind of thing wouldn't be happening. Of course, they didn't realize this bug was possible. Um, the other thing is, he, you know, he made some kind of classic mistakes. He had some stuff shipped to his house. He used a computer that he had used to do the uh, illegal stuff to like log into his work computer. Um, what's, what, it, what is interesting is, you know, the role that crypto played here. So what he was doing is buying these codes, then going on to a website called Paxful.com. Now, this is a marketplace for digital goods. You can, um, 
sell and buy gift card codes for all sorts of stores, including Microsoft. And for a long time, they weren't really doing any of the normal, you know, anti-money laundering things. Now, this is, it, it doesn't sound like money, but it, it kind of is money. And that, and that kind of misunderstanding was, you know, at the heart of this fraud. Then he was, you know, turning it into Bitcoin and laundering the Bitcoin through a, uh, uh, a sort of mixing service where it takes some, you know, crypto and changes it for other crypto. And the bottom line is it, it more or less cleans the digital currency. Um, that wasn't how they found him. They found him because of mistakes he made in the real world. Right. Uh, quite an elaborate scheme. I'm not going to give it all away, but this guy was sentenced to nine years in prison. It is a great read um, by our own Austin Carr um, and your team, Max. Uh, check it out. Bloomberg's Big Take. Thanks so much, Max Chatkin. Meantime, I want to take us into the metaverse, the so-called accelerating convergence of online games, social networking, user-generated content, and augmented and virtual reality. Now you can invest in this new burgeoning world through the new metaverse ETF. Joining us now for more, the creator of that ETF, Matthew Ball, a pillion company managing partner. Matthew, great to have you here on the show. I feel like we have to start with the question, what is the metaverse? Do tell us. Sure. I think you actually did a great job of teeing that up. The best way to think about it is a quasi-successor state to today's mobile internet in much the same way today's mobile internet built off of the internet of the 90s and 2000s. In this instance, however, the iteration is not necessarily going into a smaller computer, but into virtual worlds, virtual simulations, enabling the purchase of things in the real world through those environments but also in particular purchasing things that solely exist in said virtual environments. Lastly, we think about the augmentation of the world around us, not just the idea of AR and VR inside of a store, but really the connectivity of the real world through Internet of Things into virtual simulacra at the same time. Now, you worked in the entertainment industry for many years. You worked at Amazon Studios. So I'm curious, mm -hmm. how do you see the metaverse uh, supplant, replacing traditional forms of, of entertainment? Like, how does this actually change our lives? That's a great question. It is like most new mediums or entertainment formats, something that is at first additive or adjunct to our existing behaviors and then slowly subsumes more of that in much the same way we started listening to radio broadcast, broadcast.com in the 90s. But at this point in time, there are whole generations that primarily consume categories of media through the internet and through their mobile phones. We've seen some early examples of what's happened here when you take a look at the Travis Scott concert in Fortnite, the Little Nas X concert in Roblox. Now we're seeing people purchasing music in these virtual worlds, attending just political rallies and more. And so the overall trend is just, you can think of many of the habits that we have today transitioning to said world. Zwift, for example, a privately backed startup, I believe KKR is one of the largest investors, you can think of as a version of Peloton that exists solely in virtual environments. So Bloomberg Intelligence believes the market opportunity for the metaverse could be $800 billion by 2024. Obviously, now you can invest in it through your ETF. Who do you think are the leading players in this space from a platform perspective, and who will be the leading players? Certainly, we can identify a number of companies already that are public. Those include Unity Technologies, which is one of the largest cross-platform companies in the world when it comes to game engines and real-time rendering. Think of the technology that allows virtual environments across any device, any endpoint to actually be brought to life. But on top of that, we have a number of other companies that are part of that stack. You have companies like NVIDIA or TSMC, Broadcom, uh, the various wireless tower companies. We have to think about this like we do the internet. There are some of the end consumer platforms where I think primarily the BI estimate of 800 billion is organized. But we have to think all the way down to the companies that produce the hardware we use to access the metaverse, the compute chips that power those experiences, the networking companies that need to deliver this at ever increasing bandwidth and latency and reliability, all the way down to the content companies like your Netflixes and Tinders who have to find a way to exist in this new environment. That total TAM is now, expected where... to be in the trillions. Wow. Uh, you know, curious how you see the worlds of DeFi and the metaverse potentially converging, given, you know, obviously this is another technology that some folks are, are really bullish on. And I imagine mm -hmm. there's some intersection 
of those in this future world? Certainly. I mean, for a very large contingent of the crypto population, blockchain is synonymous with the metaverse. Cannot believe that the metaverse can or would exist without decentralized finance, blockchain technology. You know, I tend to believe that it's not a strict requirement. All of the things that blockchain does can be done through other means. The question is, is it a, a superior way of doing said things, or is it the likely way to which we do that? The best technology standards don't necessarily win. We can take a look at VHS versus Betamax. But at this point, the blockchain enthusiasts see a lot of really credible arguments here. One of the reasons why Epic Games has sued Apple is on the premise that this stage of progressive taxation through distribution actually strangles the for-profit developers who would build the metaverse. Think of the individual Roblox creator who has to pay both Roblox and Apple to the point in which there's very little left over. And so the crypto community believes that this is a way to build outside of the platforms, outside of the gatekeepers, to own collectively the technology through which they will build the metaverse and avoid the gatekeepers who control their technology choices, but in particular take most of the cut. That's a strong argument in abstraction. It will take some time to see whether or not it pans out versus you know, today's super powerful, well-funded R&D-based corporations. Wow. Matthew Ball, thank you for giving us such a deep dive into the metaverse. We will be watching and following your new ETF, Matthew Bell Ball of Apillion Company. Thanks so much for joining us. All right, coming up, as Jeff Bezos prepares to step down as CEO of Amazon, the tech giant has revised its core values. We'll tell you what new ones are on the list next. This is Bloomberg. The story we're watching days before Amazon founder Jeff Bezos steps down, the e-commerce giant has revised its corporate values. Amazon employees have always been expected to abide by the code's 14 corporate values, and now they have two new ones. The new leadership principles strive to be Earth's best employer and success and scale bring broad responsibility, require employees to take into account the well-being of their coworkers and society and the planet beyond the company's walls when they are making decisions. And Twitter tapping into the world of NFTs. The social network will offer 140 new non-fungible tokens, marking the company's first move into the world of digital assets, which have grown in popularity since the beginning of the year. Twitter says it is experimenting with NFTs on its platform as they have become a hot topic of conversation. Coming up, we're going to speak with Eric Vishria of Benchmark Capital about the company's unicorns and the red hot IPO market. That is next. This is Bloomberg. Some late breaking news out of California. The state has set a date for the gubernatorial recall election, September 14th. That's the day the special election will happen that could oust Democratic Governor Gavin Newsom from office. We're going to cover uh, that election as it continues to roll out and bring you new developments as we have them. Meantime, there is money flowing into Middle East startups. And our Bloomberg's Ed Ludlow has been taking a look. Ed, what can you tell us? Yeah, we don't often go to the Middle East, but this was a sizable round led by SoftBank in Cloud Kitchen startup Kitopi. Bring up some of the details, $450 million in the round, but crucially, it gave this Dubai-based startup a valuation of more than a billion dollars, one of the biggest deals we've actually ever seen for a Middle East technology startup. But bring up some pictures, cloud kitchens. This was one of the big themes of the global pandemic. These are specific startup kitchens that serve many different restaurants specifically for mobile order, for delivery apps, where different restaurants share a space and you can only use them for food delivery. It's something that, you know, you think would die after the pandemic, but... Kitopi say they're going to take this money and they're going to use it to expand into Saudi Arabia, later into Asia. Fantastic, the concept. And you wonder, 
the longevity, some of these concepts that were born out of the COVID-19 pandemic, will they last? Well, SoftBank is betting that this one will last and Katopi finds itself a billion dollar company. Emily. All right. We'll continue to follow. Ed, thanks so much for bringing us that story. Meantime, after a pandemic lull, the IPO market now seems to be red hot, with almost $350 billion raised in initial public offerings in the first half of the year. With us now, Eric Vishria, partner at Benchmark Capital. Eric's first investment at Benchmark was Confluent, which of course just went public last week. Eric, thanks so much for joining us. We had Jay on the show last week. I know it's a big deal for you. And interestingly, you invested in this company like a month after joining Benchmark. And I know there's this sort of traditional window where you're not supposed to make an investment for the first six months, um, but you had conviction. What gave you that conviction? You know, I think we are trying to find the handful of really special companies that where you have a kind of combination of an incredible entrepreneur, a big idea and, a, and an emerging market. And at Confluent that came together. It wasn't even called Confluent at the time. It didn't have a name. Um, but we were really fortunate to, to get introduced really early and had that feeling. And it's been quite a journey from three people to 1,500 plus in, in less than seven years. What do you think about the technology? Because obviously, you know, in part, their growth has been attributed to the pandemic uh, being this sort of central nervous, nervous system for the acceleration of all of this technology that people are using, but is that going to continue post pandemic when life returns to so-called normal? I actually don't think that the pandemic, the pandemic has been very important in terms of making companies realize generally that digital is the competitive frontier. That's where they're going to win or lose customers. That's where they're going to um, win or, or grow or decline in revenue. But for Confluent and a lot of the other software infrastructure companies and those, I think the the general move to the cloud and overall digitalization has has happened over a decade plus. It's not something that is is specific, and I think it'll continue uh, for the years to come. I don't think it, it has any signs of of slowing. Now, your partner Bill Gurley has been on the show many times, pushing the value of direct listings over traditional mm -hmm. IPOs. Other benchmark companies like Asana did direct listings instead. Why go the traditional IPO route? And how much debate was there around that around your table? Well, I think you know Asana is a great example of a company that um, is in the portfolio that didn't need to raise capital, primary capital, so put money on their balance sheet. And so the direct listing is definitely a better approach in, the, in that case. Um, and I think we're going to see more and more of those as we've seen several this year. Um, in the case of Confluent, we wanted to raise primary capital. And so uh, the direct listing wasn't an option, unfortunately. Um, but I think that'll continue to as soon as we can get through the regulatory hurdles such that companies can direct list and raise primary capital. I think that'll that'll unleash a torrent. And I think that'll become the default path in the future. The last six months have certainly been active on IPOs. Do you see uh, systemic change in the IPO market, positive change in the IPO market? Because the complaints have been this is an antiquated um, way to get to the public markets that don't necessarily benefit the people it's supposed to benefit. I, th I think there has actually been change in the IPO market. Like any market, you know, competition tends to tends to um, unlock possibilities and and make make everyone put their best foot forward. And so I think the competition from direct listings and, and even to a lesser extent SPACs has actually kind of made some improvements in the traditional IPO process. Confluent was an example, I think the second example behind DoorDash of a company that didn't have a green shoe, for example. Um, you see a lot of these IPOs have earlier employee lockup releases, which is beneficial. So you don't have this kind of artificial six month cliff and then all of a sudden all the insiders can sell. You can kind of stage it out over over time, which I think benefits everybody, including the public market investors. Um, so I think there have been some meaningful steps forward. Um, having said that, I, I, I think there's still quite a bit of progress to be made. And uh, I think a direct listing ultimately um, is the path and the place that, that we'll end up, hopefully. 
Interesting. Um, Robinhood filed to go public today, officially. Um, Bill has also been pretty outspoken about Robinhood, saying they're glorifying speculation. The SEC should ban payment for order flow. When you look at a company like Robinhood, you know, what do you think about the legitimacy of their business model? I, you know, I haven't had the chance. I saw the news that the S1 uh, came out or flipped today, but I haven't had a chance to read it. You know, payment for order flow is controversial, um, but Obviously, a lot of companies, not just Robinhood, use that as a as their business model. Uh, so that seems to be a, a a regulatory question, I guess, more than anything else, and and certainly outside my area of expertise. Now, you are one of a newer the, generation the of bench. Okay. OK, you're one of a newer generation of, of, of Benchmark's partners. And, um, you know, we're seeing the, the sort of more traditional venture capital industry evolve. We're obviously coming out of a pandemic. Uh, the world is going through another massive transformation. How do you expect the firm to evolve, to respond to that? And where is Benchmark and where are you going to be placing your bets? I think it's one of the really cool things about the benchmark partnership. You know, we tend to be about five active partners at any at any given time, and for the last say 26 years since the founding of the firm, um, that's been a that's been an evolution, and it's always something where we have some newer partners and and some partners retiring. The thing that we have stayed uh, stayed true to is we love finding you know this handful of really special companies, really special opportunities every year. Each one of us makes one to two investments a year, um, and we think of them as commitments. They're decade-long commitments. They're not bets. They're commitments. And so we're making one to two of those a year. They're, they're well thought out, and then we hopefully are able to work with those companies for, for a decade plus, like in the case of Asana, like in the case of Confluent, and see them all the way through to, to massive success and beyond. And so I think that part of the model is really going to stay true. You know, of course, valuations move up, um, the dynamics, the industry, and where the white space is for new companies um, changes over time. But the, the core model, we, we stay true to that, and we love it. All right. Well, you got Confluent under your belt. Uh, we'll keep watching uh, how things evolve, where you place your bets. Eric Vishria of Benchmark Capital, thanks so much for joining us. All right, coming up. California's push to go green. Regulators have approved, approved a proposal for eight and a half gigawatts of green power. We'll talk about the move to a greener grid next. This is Bloomberg. Chinese automaker Geely is exploring its fundraising options after backing away from listing on Shanghai's Nasdaq-style starboard. In his first international media interview since becoming CEO, Daniel Lee told Bloomberg he's confident about consumer demand in China. Uh, the uh, board of directors of World War Class uh, decided that World War uh, will uh, uh, seek the opportunity to uh, be listed uh, in uh, Stockholm uh, Nasdaq uh, uh, Stock Exchange. Mm -hmm. uh, but we, uh, from GD Holding, we didn't set up uh, any uh, uh, timeline requirement. Uh, we believe the market uh, and the regulators uh, will uh, come with very hot support uh, and uh, welcome attitude to World War's uh, potential IPO. Would you be looking for a valuation above Daimler? We cannot say uh, uh, we, uh, uh, you know, target uh, uh, to uh, uh, beat Daimler because uh, both Volvo and Daimler are uh, GD's uh, uh, investment, mm. GD's uh, uh, stake. Uh, but uh, we are quite uh, confident that uh, Volvo will uh, be given very good valuation by the market. And an IPO potentially in September of this year? We will uh, uh, see the uh, uh, you know, communications uh, between uh, World War team with uh, uh, the regulators and also uh, potential investors. 
uh, again, we don't set up any pressure on the uh, timeline, but uh, we believe we can move uh, 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 quite fast. Uh, could Volvo make Apple's car? I think uh, uh, it's possible to uh, develop any uh, uh, new car development uh, ideas. Uh, yes. Including, especially including Apple's car? Uh, I, I don't mean Apple's car mm. itself, I yeah. just mean the new uh, 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 the modern uh, 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 smart cars with uh, all the best features of uh, connectivity, uh, automotive drive, uh, uh, shared mobility, yeah. uh, and pr to uh, provide the best uh, uh, user experience. Mm. Okay, have you or any of the team at Geely had any conversations with Apple? No. Okay, but you would welcome that conversation? Yes. Uh, uh, for your information, uh, we are uh, open to have the partnerships with uh, uh, you know, our uh, strategic uh, uh, industrial and uh, internet uh, leaders uh, to form the strategic uh, partnerships. As you have seen, uh, we uh, have uh, partnership with uh, Baidu, so we are very open to uh, uh, introduce uh, this kind of uh, partnerships and uh, business models with any potential strategic partners. Tesla has faced a few headwinds in the market. They've had to do a software fix for almost all of their vehicles in the Chinese market. There's been, there was a protest at the auto show. There have been some concerns about security features. Is China turning on Tesla? I, uh, I believe uh, Chinese government and also Chinese uh, consumers uh, are quite open. But in the end, the product you know, should satisfy the fundamental requirement of uh, customers, uh, including not only the uh, uh, connectivity, uh, modern designs, uh, but also uh, safety and quality. Uh, so I don't think. Uh, anybody uh, try to make any uh, 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 obstacles deliberately to Tesla. I think it's just the, the market. Rare interview there with the CEO of Geely and our own Tom McKenzie. Meantime, California has become one of the most aggressive states to make that move to go green. First, with trying to get as many electric cars on the road as possible. Now, the state is trying to do away with nuclear and gas plants and has gotten the okay to do so. California regulators approving a proposal for an 11 and a half gigawatts of green power. Joining us now are Bloomberg reporter Mark Chediak in our City Lab series. So, Mark, what exactly is California doing here and what does it mean? Yeah, so the state is essentially trying to replace its largest source of carbon free energy. That comes from the Diablo Canyon nuclear power plant uh, situated on the coastline of California. There's an agreement for that plant to shut down by 2025. Uh, there were concerns about uh, the plant being located near some seismic areas. So there were some safety concerns and also cost concerns that the plant was going to have to meet certain environmental requirements that were going to be really expensive in terms of making upgrades. So essentially the state has to replace that power and since it does have a goal, like you said, to have a, a green grid essentially by 2045, what they're looking for is carbon-free energy to replace uh, that nuclear power plant. And essentially, that's going to have to come from uh, renewables like solar and wind, as well as uh, some energy efficiency. And they're also going to try to put a lot of batteries on the grid to store that renewable energy and push it onto the grid when the uh, sun isn't shining and the wind isn't blowing. Now, the recent heat waves have really taxed the grids uh, uh, across the country. And I'm curious, is this a preview of, of more of what's to come with climate change? Yes, I mean, that's a great point. I mean, I think what, you know, what people are saying now is that we have basically a, 20, a, a grid built in the 20th century, but it's not prepared for 21st century weather. And so what we've seen just this summer is uh, California had a brush with blackouts. Uh, during a heat wave where they were telling, basically asking consumers in the state to uh, dial back their air conditioners during a heat wave. Uh, we saw rolling blackouts in Washington during a historic heat wave there just this week. And then just yesterday, uh, the utility in New York, Con Ed, 
essentially asked all of New York to conserve power to maintain stability on that grid so they didn't have blackouts there. So what's next? What are you watching for? Well, I think the big question here, here is how does California and the rest of the country make this transition to green energy but maintain re reliable power flows? So what you're seeing here is a lot of fossil fuel plants retire, and those are being replaced by uh, intermittent sources of power that can't be called on all the time. So the, so the challenge that um, grid operators in California and across the country are going to face is they have to figure out a way to get this renewable energy on the grid but also backstop it with other sources that are clean. All right. Mark Chediak, thanks so much for bringing us that story. We'll continue to follow how that all evolves. Okay. Bloomberg's Mark Chediak. Coming up, Blue Origin has revealed the third member, the third person who will be heading into space on its July 20th mission with Jeff Bezos, 82-year-old Wally Funk joining the spaceship. More next. And as we had to break a sweet debut for Christy, Krispy Kreme as the company went public and shares rose above the IPO price, Krispy Kreme is one of 18 companies to come to market this week, marking the busiest IPO week since 2004. This is Bloomberg. zero gravity for four minutes. You come back down, we land gently on the desert surface, we open the hatch, and you step outside. What's the first thing you say? I will say, honey, that was the best thing that ever happened to me. <laughs> Welcome back to Bloomberg Technology. I'm Emily Chang in San Francisco. That was Jeff Bezos and Wally Funk, Blue Origin, unveiling the third crew member of the mission that will head to the stars July 20th. Six decades after completing astronaut trading, 82-year-old Wally Funk will be joining Jeff Bezos and his brother Mark aboard the New Shepard and blasting off from the West Texas desert. Joining us now with all the mission details, our spaceman Ed Ludlow. Ed, it's such a heartwarming video that Blue Origin shared there. What do we know about Wally Funk? I know she was training as an astronaut 60 years ago, yes. and she never got to go to space, but now she will. Exactly, exactly. At 82 years old, she'll be the oldest person to go into space. She's had such an incredible life. In the late 50s and early 60s, she was part of the Mercury 13, basically initiative by NASA to prove that women could go into space alongside their male astronaut colleagues. But the program was shut down, and she never did go into space despite completing the official NASA training. Over the course of her life, she flew more than 19,000 hours as a pilot and taught 3,000 people how to fly. So it's just an incredibly uh, a story of somebody that was so close earlier in her life to going into space, now at the age of 82, actually being able to do it, even if it's just for a few minutes of weightlessness. Now, talk to us about what these astronauts are doing to prepare to this, for this mission. I mean, has Wally Funk been eating her Wheaties? Um, what is Jeff Bezos eating for breakfast? I mean, what do they need to do to prepare to do this? I mean, in truth, we don't really know. We know that they're going to turn up for three days ahead of the launch, do some last kind of minute training. Um, Blue Origin told me on Thursday that all of the astronauts or all of the pilots in the mission are compliant with the requirements that Blue Origin has set. I, you know, I basically asked, with respect, has Wally Funk passed a medical in order to go up into space? Have the other astronauts? And that's what Blue Origin told me, that they are fit enough and meet the criteria that Blue Origin set in order for them to undergo this mission. Now, we know there are six seats, right, on the rocket. Exactly. And uh, they still haven't revealed the auction winner, correct? So correct. do we have any more information about who's going to fill those three other seats? So we still think there are only four going up, even though there are six seats. Before 
Wally Funk was announced, we thought that the other seat that was not the auction winner would be a trained professional astronaut, somebody that was either currently an astronaut or, or perhaps recently retired. That's not been the case. So it's, it's Jeff Bezos, his brother Mark Bezos, Wally Funk, and we're still awaiting to find out who that auction winner is. Remember, they paid $28 million for that seat. So hopefully, you know, it's worth their while. The launch goes ahead. But it's still a mystery. They say they'll unveil it in the weeks before the launch, which is July 20th. And do we know for sure those last two seats won't be filled? Are they going to so keep those empty? What I'm hearing from Laurigen is that they'll keep them empty. And remember, there's no controls up on the inside the capsule. There's no sort of buttons to press. You simply recline back a little bit, stare out the window to take it all in, you know, under extreme force and aerodynamic stress. And in that moment at the Kármán line, 62 miles above Earth, the officially recognized boundary of space, just four minutes of weightlessness, as Jeff Bezos says, before you sort wow. of slowly trickle back down to Earth under parachute. Sounds easy. Gosh, I'm stressed thinking about it, Emily. I, I mean, I, I personally <laughs> I know, me I would be terrified to do that. <laughs> it sounds terrifying. <laughs> me too, and I certainly would want an experienced tour guide, but we'll see. Uh, Bloomberg's Ed Ludlow, thanks so much for that report. That does it for this edition of Bloomberg Technology. I'm Emily Chang in San Francisco. Thanks for watching. This is Bloomberg.